So welcome everyone to this episode of the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia's monthly podcast, where we highlight noteworthy articles from each issue. I'm Julian Ressler, Assistant Social Media Editor for the Journal and your host for today's interview. I would like to offer a really warm welcome to Dr. Jan van Rijk, the lead author of an article from our June issue titled Oxygenation During General Anesthesia in Pediatric Patients. This was a retrospective observational study. Thank you so much for taking your time to talk with me today. So let's start with a short introduction. Jan, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role in this study? Yes, good evening, everyone. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me in your uh, podcast. Really pleased to uh, answer all your uh, questions uh, today. Um, my name is uh, Jan van Wijk, and I'm a pediatric anesthesiologist uh, in Erasmus uh, MC Sophia Children's Hospital in uh, Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, and we um, uh, did this uh, uh, research uh, beca because we uh, earlier did a validation uh, study for a transcutaneous uh, monitor. Um, it was another research uh, project where we uh, validate that monitor uh, in children with an arterial line and a tracheal tube. Uh, and when a uh, blood gas uh, analysis was done, well, we noted all uh, the other measurements as well. And during the analysis of that particular study, we noted that actually all our patients were hyperoxygenated. Um, as is, well, we just we we noticed it in our in 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 all those blood gases. Um, so we thought it might be wise to do a formal study to this uh, phenomenon as well. Um, so that's where we started, and uh, and 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 that's where uh, we are here now with this uh, uh, article. Um, so we uh, yeah we performed another uh, study to. Um, um, it was a, a retrospective uh, study uh, to um, uh, uh, to get all our blood uh, uh, blood gases from a particular time uh, frame uh, after the implementation of our new uh, electronic health uh, record back in uh, two, 2017. And we well, we took a time frame for uh, a couple of years uh, until 2020, um, and we dived uh, deeper in all those analyses. Uh, which we did in that time frame in our operation uh, theater, and we well we found as we well as we actually expected because we knew it from our validation study. <laughs> we uh, we found indeed uh, that uh, well over ninety percent of our patients were um, hyperoxygenated. Um, okay. Very yes. Much. So, Jan, you already started a little bit with um, my first question. So that would be if we go to right to the interview, if you could briefly summarize the current study to listeners. So yeah. you already did some of it, but let me in a little bit more detail. And then, um, I mean, you explained your personal motivation, how you um, how you came to this topic, but maybe also the motivation for the field of anesthesiology behind this study. Yes, well, <laughs> I was maybe a little bit too uh, too quick, indeed. Um, uh, so we uh, we thought it 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 might be important to 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 dive deeper in this uh, phenomenon because we are uh, obviously uh, uh, working together with uh, not only our own team of pediatric anesthesiologists but also with our. Uh, um, pediatricians at the intensive care uh, uh, units in our uh, hospital and especially the neonatal uh, neonatologists uh, they are well very keen on oxygen uh, management for uh, obvious reasons uh, and well we are well uh, a lot of time um, we're making jokes uh, about our uh, lack of regulations on oxygen management uh, uh, in the operation theater compared to their well very strict guidelines uh, for uh, for oxygen management in the neonatal intensive care uh, unit. Um, and well, since we are uh, working together uh, more and more, um, also uh, because we established um, uh, guidelines for. Um, 
a neonatal surgery a few years ago, uh, together also with uh, the neonatologists, uh, we thought it, it might be wise to, um, uh, yeah, to 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 look further at what we are doing exactly uh, in the operation teeth there, and to start there uh, to improve uh, our um, daily clinical work. So that's uh, a little bit of the background of uh, of, of 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 this uh, of this study. Um, and uh, another, um, uh, and, 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 well, we, 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 of course, we, we, we looked in, um, in, in the medical literature, if there was maybe something done uh, like this before, and we only found um, uh, on, on perioperative oxygen uh, management, we found a study in the, um, in the United Kingdom from uh, uh, Morgan in uh, 2018, where they more or less did the same um, uh, what we uh, what we wanted to do. Uh, only it was in adults and it was a, a prospective uh, study, uh, but nothing in, uh, in, uh, in in children. So we thought, well, we can uh, <laughs> uh, we have a we have a gap here. What we uh, could fill in. No, so we so obviously um, I mean it's uh, like you mentioned it's a common problem that was also your finding right. So you're primary outcome was uh, the presence of um, hyperoxemia. Um, and as you said, you found that in approximately 90% of all patients. So my next question would be regarding um, your methodology. And um, this is a bit of, it's, it's a, I know the answer, but maybe you could explain it uh, for our readers. So it was a retrospective study. Um, you had a primary outcome of um, hyperoxemia in 90% of patients. And, um, but also in your analysis, you uh, did not adjust for possible confounders when you um, analyzed that primary outcome. Could you explain to us why this was not necessary in this case? Yeah, well, actually, we just wanted to show what we were <laughs> doing uh, on a daily basis, and it it's a, a big academic uh, pediat pediatric uh, uh, hospital. Um, we have a standalone operating uh, theater. Um, and we do all types of surgery um, with one exception, that's the uh, cardiac surgery. Mm -hmm. um, so we included uh, all non-cardiac uh, uh, patients um, in our analysis. Um, and we, well, we just wanted to show what our data uh, uh, was, uh, of is, um, actually just with some basic statistics, uh, no, uh, no fancy uh, uh, st statistics uh, 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 so far. And actually, we, 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 we didn't even think about uh, adjusting. And also in the review process, we we're not asked to 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 do so. We we did some sub analysis uh, for age and um, uh, ASA classification, um, but our primary thought was just, well, this is our data. Mm -hmm. This is what it is. Um, uh, yeah. So we that's the reason why we uh, uh, didn't uh, do any uh, adjustments so mm -hmm. far. This is also one of the reasons why. Um... I especially I like your study so much because um, it's a purely descriptive analysis, right? Yes. So there is no need for confounder adjustment. And this is something we see rarely in retrospective studies nowadays that, I mean, your data um, just speaks for itself, right? You're just showing descriptively a huge problem and, um, and um, that's just the data and there is no need for adjustment. That's exactly our point. <laughs> Yeah, and so that would lead me to um, my next question: Is um, now that we know how frequent this is, um, we know there are some negative effects of hyperoxia. Could you elaborate on the potential clinical implications of this finding? Yeah, that's um, that's obviously the next uh, uh, the next uh, the next question. Um, there are uh, some arguments that um, 
well, hyperxemia could be uh, uh, also have a, a, a positive effect on uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting or surgical side infections, but it's uh it's it's very there's very little evidence um to say so especially uh, uh in uh, in 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 children so there is a lack of evidence for a positive effect of hyperoxemia um and especially in uh, uh in children um and on and on the other hand there are um a lot of yeah well negative uh, effects um especially at the younger uh, in the younger age uh, uh, groups um and there is and there is something of of a time frame huh? um in the up, up, procedures in the operating theater there are it's 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 short term um so we are also wondering is it is it is it that is it such a big thing um and there are uh, of course moments during uh, during an operation that we need those high levels of uh, oxygen uh, during induction and emergence of uh, anesthesia um but in the meantime um we 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 do think together with our pediatricians uh, that we uh, uh, well should be more precise in uh, in titrating uh, oxygen, um, because why? Yeah, why should why, why shouldn't why shouldn't we do so? Yeah. So um, when you mentioned um, the obvious negative effects of um, of hyperoxemia, and um, I mean as anesthesiologists, there are some um let's say more obvious one like uh we talk a lot about resorption atelectasis and whatnot but then there is always um this discussion with uh, the reactive oxygen species right the ros so mm -hmm. um and as you said um and this comes from adult anesthesia as well is that a lot of people think that over a short period of time, let's say a couple of hours of anesthesia, the effect of reactive oxygen species would be negligible. Um, could you discuss um, why um, these effects may be particularly pronounced in neonates, though? And um, yeah, I mean, what steps could you take to mitigate these risks during anesthesia? Yeah, that's yeah, that's particularly true, and it also um, has effects on um, the retina, of course, um, uh, on the uh, intestines, um, and it's 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 probably true that the effects for a short term are yeah, well, maybe neglectable, um, but the the the. The real answer is that we we are not we are so far we are not sure, and it will probably we are probably not able to um, do such big studies uh, to discover the real answer. What is what is what is the real answer? Uh, because the perioperative uh, uh, safety margins are nowadays they are so high that it 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 will be well nearly impossible to. Uh, uh, to give the to find the real answer, um, but if we turn it around, why should we take the risk of uh, giving so much oxygen during moments that it is not necessary? And again, of course, we will have our moments during induction and uh, during emergency uh, surgeries and uh, during emer uh, during um, uh, emergence of anesthesia that we will uh, give high fractions of oxygen, of course. Um, but again, if we turn the question around, why shouldn't we lower it in between? Because we also know that the reserve capacity of children is is not is 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 less than in 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 adults. So we um, we won't fill the uh, functional residual capacity compared to uh, uh, adults. Um, 
so in moments that we need oxygen, we should just uh, uh, give more oxygen and um, give more uh, 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 more flow as well. Um, and in seconds, you will be uh, back uh, back on uh, the levels that you want. Um, and again, in between, we we should uh, pay more attention to uh, uh, to those levels. Um, and it was a nice editorial in the, in the British Journal. It's almost it's already more than ten years ago from uh, uh, Martin, um, where he stated that oxygen is probably the most used drug in anesthesia. Now, well, we should start to act accordingly. Yeah. I mean, this is a really good point to make. Um, although you know, your research may be interpreted as a call for more conservative oxygen administration, um, maybe especially in specific subgroups such as um, preemies, neonates. And yes. as you said, in anesthesia, the high FiO2 is often because we want to have a safety margin, especially during induction. Some would say maybe also a little bit of a safety margin during maintenance. So specifically, what protocols or guidelines would you recommend to standardize oxygen use in um, pediatric anesthesia to optimize hyperoxemia, but as well as safety? Yeah, first of all, we should start with a clear definition because there is no definition of hyperoxemia. We, I really did my best to find one, but actually there is none. And so we should start with a clear uh, definition and then we can talk further about uh, 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 protocols. But we have, of course, our IDs. Um, they should include, um, uh, well, different um, uh, default values of the, our, our very anesthetic machines. They are, well, most of the time they are set at 100%. Uh, it's probably not necessary. Eighty or sixty will uh, uh, will do, um, and then um, we have to talk about um, uh, what we are going to do with our monitors, uh, because it looked it looks like we are not uh, adjusting our values based on our daily routine uh, monitoring, uh, as we showed in our article um, at 98, 99 percent. Um, at your um, uh, pulse oximeter, well, every child or every patient is hyper uh, hyper oxygenated. Um, so at that level, at your um, uh, pulse oximeter, uh, you could start to adjust your uh, uh, inspiratory fraction of uh, of oxygen to a lower level. And of course, you should also uh, adjust your uh, level. Uh, when you're having an arterial line and you do a regular uh, uh, blood gas analysis. Um, and then uh, in the end, um, if it's local or, 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 or national or international, you can, um, in specific type of, of patients, you can, you can just um, uh, make a, yeah, a clear, uh, a clear definitions uh, of uh, um, pulse of your, of your pulse of, oximeter boundaries, uh, which you should use, uh, as we do actually in, in every other area of uh, medicine, at the intensive care unit, in the emergency department, everywhere where we go, we start adjusting uh, the, the, the inspiratory fraction, uh, but at the operating, operating theater, we, 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 we don't. Uh, so that's, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fa fascinating uh, phenomenon. We do, so, so we can do it because we do it in other types, uh, in, in other surroundings. Um, so we should start to do so uh, in the OR as well. Yeah, very good. That's uh, that is a great take home message and um, a good point to end our interview on. Uh, Jan, I want to thank you so much for taking your time. This was um, a very um, good talk. I think uh, I learned a lot. Our listeners can learn a lot. And um, uh, if you have not done so, I recommend highly to read the article Oxygenation During General Anesthesia in Pediatric Patients 
from the June issue at the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia. Thank you again so much, Jan, and have a nice evening. My pleasure. Thank you very much.